Thank, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm Mark Boer. Uh, I recently started a, a new company called uh, Sphere AI, where I work mostly with Python on, uh, on data problems. And uh, today I'll be uh, taking you along into an introduction to the global interpreter lock, uh, which is something you occasionally have to wrestle in order to get your code to perform the best. So uh, welcome to uh, Today I Learned About the Global Interpreter Lock. Um, let's get started with the name Global Interpreter Lock. So uh, the lock, uh, a lock in programming is very much like a lock on a bathroom door. It's there to protect something and to make sure that only one person is using that something at the same time. Um, and very much in the case of programming, as, as with a bathroom door, the lock on your bathroom, if, if, you have only, if you're the only one home, it's probably fairly safe to not lock your bathroom door. However, as soon as there are multiple people there, uh, you definitely want to lock that door. And the same holds for threading. If you only have one thread, uh, there's basically no reason to use a lock. Uh, however, if you're using multiple threads, uh, you want to lock those resources in order to avoid some uh, uh, unwanted uh, race condition. So what is the resource that we're protecting here? In Python, uh, the resource we're protecting is the interpreter. So the interpreter is the thing that takes your code and then executes that code. And Python does this in two steps. Uh, so the first step is a compilation step. It takes your code and then compiles that to uh, bytecode instructions. And if you've ever seen the .pyc files next to your Python files, of it, or if you've ever opened your uh, PyCache folder in Python 3, uh, you can see those uh, uh, bytecode instructions there. Um, and then the interpreter, which is the second step, it takes those bytecode instructions, and the interpreter is basically just a, a giant if uh, while loop uh, that takes bytecode by bytecode and then executes those bytecode one by one. And then uh, it had yeah, whatever you told your code to do, uh, that happened. And then the final thing, it's a global, meaning there's only one, uh, which is probably the reason uh, why it's got parts of it bad rep. Uh, global is generally considered uh, a bad practice in programming. Uh, however, in, in Python, it's actually, uh, uh, the gil is actually a good choice. So it's a global, or to be fair, there's, no, there's only one per Python interpreter. Uh, so uh, we can wor work around that a little bit. Um, so we know there's a global lock protecting the Python interpreter, but what is the problem it's trying to solve? And that would be reference counting. So Python uses a, a reference counting strategy as part of its garbage collection. Uh, every Python object uh, holds an internal reference count, and it basically says how many other Python objects are pointing uh, to, to that Python object, hold a reference to that Python object. And if you as assign a Python object to a variable name, uh, it will set the reference count to one. If you then add it to a list, it will increment the ref reference count by one. Uh, if, you add, if you add it as an argument to a function, it will add the reference count as one. And uh, as soon as it then drops out of scope, or uh, is removed from that list, or uh, yeah, uh, whatever else you want to do, you call tell on an object so that it's no longer uh, 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 referenced by that variable. Uh, and as soon as that reference count hits zero, uh, Python knows it's safe to destroy that object. Uh, so, so we can safely destroy this Python object, release that memory back into the memory pool, and then uh, use that memory to, to allocate new Python objects. And you can actually have a look at the reference count from within Python as well. I'm not entirely sure why you want to do it, but it's there. Uh, if you import the sys module and you call the sys.getrep count, uh, you can see the reference count of certain Python objects. And you can uh, find some interesting quirks if you do this. Uh, for example, the uh, first few integers in Python are actually globals, so they have a ridiculously high reference count. Uh, they share the reference count across your entire Python program. Uh, but yeah, so if we have a, a list of a couple of, uh, couple of values and we then call the re get ref count, uh, it prints two. Interestingly, uh, the reference count is set to one as soon as you create a list. Uh, but as soon as you pass it to a function, uh, the function argument also increments the reference count by one. So it actually prints two. And then if you assign it to, a, to another variable, uh, it will then print three because there's two variable names pointing to that same Python object. Um, well. Why was the gil chosen as a solution for this problem? Uh, to get a little bit of context, it was, this was back in 1992. Uh, this was before the time of 
uh, multi-core uh, computers, multi-core CPUs. Uh, but there, there's, there's other languages, right? I mean, Python is not the only dynamic language. There's other dynamic languages that do not have a guild. I mean, uh, the Python we all know and love is not, only, is not the only Python implementation. There, there are other Python implementations that do not have a guild. Uh, things like Jython, which is Python written in Java. Uh, they don't have a guild. They use the garbage collection of, of the JVM. Um, so a, a couple of reasons why it was implemented is it's really simple. It's very easy to get right, um, which is uh, a fortunate thing to do because as uh, a, a library developer, uh, you need to uh, work with that reference count. Uh, there's also no deadlocks. A deadlock happens when you have multiple locks and you're holding one lock and trying to access another lock and another thread it holds the second lock and is trying to access the first lock. And in that case, your, your program freezes. It will just, it will just uh, stop working uh, because uh, they're both, both threads are waiting for each other, uh, resulting uh, in, in your program freezing. And finally, there's very little overhead. Uh, so for single threaded code, uh, the gil is actually a great solution. Uh, you, have to, you have to touch the gil very little, and uh, it, works, uh, it works really well. Uh, people tried to remove in the gil in 1999, and that made pi single threaded Python four to seven times slower. So the gil is actually part of the reason why Python is as performant as it is. Um, yeah, so generally the implications of the gil is that in one Python process, only one Python bytecode is executing at any one time. And uh, to have a look at what the implications of this is in, is in programming, uh, we'll be writing some multi-threaded Python code. Uh, so let's say we have a function called do something. It does a, a bunch of nothing. And uh, we want to call that function 20 times. That's, that's all we're doing here. Uh, so the first step in uh, towards getting this parallel uh, to, to, to using multi-threading is uh, we're going to take this for loop and we're going to write that a little bit more functional. Uh, we're going to use the map function. Uh, the map function is a built-in Python function that takes a, a function and an iterable and just calls that function on every element within that iterable. And the next step is uh, we import a thread pool executor from the concurrent.futures module, which is uh, inside the, the Python standard library. And instead of calling map directly as a, as a free function, uh, we call map as a member function of that pool. And when creating that thread pool, uh, we can give it uh, uh, the max number of workers, which is the maximum number of threads it's allowed to use. And uh, finally, if we want, we can uh, print those values if we want. Um, now, let's compare the speed of these two. Uh, the first one we're just calling do something one after the other and this takes about one second. Um, next time, we're using a thread pool, so we have four threads, so theoretically, you could get a four times speed up. Uh, I mean, uh, each thread would probably do uh, roughly uh, five of those, uh, of those calls, uh, but we gotta slow down. So what is going on? We have four threads doing the same thing, and it's actually slower than just having one thread doing that same thing. Uh, well, what's going on is that we have these four threads and they're all fighting for access of that gil. Uh, because you need to hold the gil in order to execute a bytecode, uh, uh, there's only one thread that can, can execute a bytecode at any one time. And because of the overheads of the thread creation, as well as that fighting among each other for that gil, uh, you actually see a, uh, uh, see a performance decrease instead of a performance increase. And one of the reasons that this is the problem has to do with this function do something. It does a whole bunch of nothing. Uh, I could have just as easily written time.sleep there and just sleep for one second. But there's a very good reason that I wrote this empty loop there. And that's because we want to hammer that CPU. This is a CPU bound task, uh, so it takes a lot of CPU. And we're continually calling uh, bytecodes within that Python interpreter. Uh, there's also other types of tasks called IO bound tasks. And those are tasks where the CPU spends most of the time idling. And, uh, these are generally fairly slow uh, uh, operations, uh, like time.sleep. I'm not sure if you can call time.sleep an I.O. bound operation, but yeah, it's your CPU is idling. It's just waiting for that timer to run out. Uh, there's also others like uh, writing to your hard drive, uh, which is generally considered uh, orders of magnitude slower than just doing a CPU operation, uh, but also requests to some web server, 
or a database request, uh, those are all I.O. bound applications where your CPU spends most of the time idle. And in these I.O. bound applications, uh, the Python interpreter actually uh, releases the GIL. So for all I.O. bound applications within the standard library, Python releases the GIL and then within the C code, because Python is written in C, it calls those slow operations and then as soon as it comes back into Python, it will reacquire the GIL and then you can do uh, with the results whatever you want to do. So if we write that same code as we saw before, uh, where we had a, a, a task, in this case our task is uh, request.get, and we want to call that over a bunch of URLs, uh, we can see that it takes about 40 seconds. And when we use the thread pool executor, uh, again with four threads, uh, we can see that it's roughly four times faster. So this works great. I mean, uh, this is exactly what you want to use a, a, a thread pool for in Python. And this was also the original use of threads in Python. Back in 1992, there was uh, no real reason to use multi-threading for CPU-bound tasks. I mean, you only had one core, so what's the point of, of multi-threading CPU-bound tasks? Uh, it, was, it was used for this, for IO-bound tasks, where you spend most of the time idle. And you can actually go beyond the number of cores you have in your computer. Uh, so for example, if I use 32 threads, uh, you get a, a further performance increasement. Uh, at some point, you do get diminishing returns, of course. Uh, at some point, the overhead of the thread creation uh, actually slows you down. Uh, so you're gonna go infinitely far uh, as you'd like. So if we wanna, do, if we wanna uh, parallelize uh, CPU-bound tasks, uh, we can use something called a process pool executor. Uh, so this is part of the same Python module, also concurrent.futures, uh, and the only difference we have is, well, I can't talk about it, is instead of using a thread pool executor, we use a process pool executor. Other than that, it's exactly the same. And if we, use, if we do this, we do get that close to four times speed up that we would expect. Uh, but behind the covers, there's, there's something interesting going on. So who here has used a process pool executor before? And who here has run into some really weird errors while using the process pool executor? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> almost all of you. Uh, so what the process pool executor does behind the covers is, is that it calls os.fork on Linux. It calls, uh, it calls spawn on Windows, which has a little bit more overhead. And uh, so on an operating system level, uh, your Python process gets, gets forked, gets split into multiple processes. And this has the unfortunate side effect uh, that all the results that you want to pass from one process to the other uh, needs to be serialized and then piped to that other process. So all the arguments that you want to uh, uh, give to that functions uh, need to be able to be serialized. And Python uses pickle, to pickle for this. Pickle is a way to uh, serialize Python objects. And uh, so you get these unfortunate constraints uh, also, if you have a lot of communication to do between the different processes, uh, you quickly get into some, some trouble. Uh, so there's, you no longer have that shared state uh, that you can use. Uh, there's there's a, f a few things in the standard library that you can use for this, uh, but it's, 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 it's hard, it's generally considered hard. Uh, also, because you're forking your main process, it doesn't work in things like JupyterLab, for example, or JupyterHub, uh, because your main process is actually your web server, and Python is embedded within that web server. Uh, I've actually done this once where I had Python embedded into a desktop application, and as soon as I called uh, multiprocessing, it would actually just spin up a second version of that desktop application. It would just open another window, uh, which is really unfortunate. Um, so in this case, Python it comes from this, this cuddly Python that we all know and love. It becomes this, this dangerous snake. Uh, that we have to work around. So uh, if it works within your constraints, if it's trivially, trivi trivially parallelizable, uh, it works really great. Uh, however, uh, as soon as you get out of those constraints, it's, uh, it becomes, uh, becomes really quite difficult. Uh, now there's something we can do that falls somewhere in between there. Um, you can actually release the gill for uh, CPU bound tasks as well. But unfortunately you have to do your processing in something other than Python. And one of the things that you can use is something like Numba or Cython, uh, where you have a, a function that is actually compiled. Uh, so it's no longer using Python to run this function. And 
with Numba, you can, can add an argument, no gil. Uh, with Cytan, you can do the same thing. Uh, so that Python knows that it can release the gil before calling its function. The unfortunate thing about compiled languages is that you can no longer use empty loops because they will be optimized out of there entirely, which is why I had to write a, a, a big for loop that actually does something kind of useful. Uh, so this calculates pi, uh, and if I, uh, if I uh, multi-thread this with four threads, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can, can again see this close to four times speed up that we would expect. Um, this is also more or less the same thing that uh, most data science applications do. They do, their, uh, they do their heavy computational work within C or C++ or maybe use Cython. Uh, not only is that much faster already uh, because it's using a compiled language, uh, you also get the benefit of, uh, of releasing the GIL. Uh, so making sure that uh, at least to some extent those, uh, uh, those data science tasks can be multi-threaded. TensorFlow will do the multi-threading for you. It will just take all the resources you can give it uh, and just take it all and, uh, and do your computation. Uh, so you have to be a little bit careful running it on your laptop. It just overheats really quickly. And uh, uh, so this is, this is a, a way you can work around that. Um, but instead of going really into the nitty gritty, uh, I thought it would be fun to take a step back because so far we've only been focusing on the left side of this image uh, where we're going from one core to all your cores on your computer. And instead there's a bunch of tasks as well uh, that require more than that, that require multiple cores across many computers. Uh, you typically go into the cloud and you get some, uh, uh, you want some program to run distributed uh, among that cluster. And one of the things that you can do uh, there is, is uh, using something like a queue and a producer consumer pattern. And the funny thing is that Python actually works really great for these kind of processes. Um, so we have some queue, could be a Kafka cluster, or it could be something else. Uh, and we have one or more producers that uh, send messages to this queue. And then we have a bunch of consumers. Uh, if you're using Kafka, you'll probably put them in a consumer group uh, that consume these messages and then call that function do something. And since we have just uh, very many Python interpreters running, uh, we're just working around that gill entirely. Uh, this cluster could be anything. It could be a bunch of VMs. You could use, use something like a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, one of the things that you can do is package Python into a Docker container, then give that Docker container exactly one core as resources to use, and you've completely worked around the gill. Because Python within a Docker container only has that one process to use, and it works great. It works very good. Um, so this works well for trivial, trivially paralyzable problems, uh, but there's also problems that are not. And there you can use something like uh, PySpark or Dask. So what Dask does is uh, if you have a Dask array, a data frame of some kind, or you have a, 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 a Dask data frame, uh, you, it, Dask splits that, that array or data frame into many smaller arrays or data frames. And then uh, is able to distribute those smaller arrays to the different workers in your cluster, uh, and that way you can get great, uh, uh, what's it, multi, uh, great multi-core performance. So for example, if we have this large array on the left here, and we wanted to call the, the sum of that array, uh, Dask would send those individual smaller arrays to the different workers in your cluster, uh, they would all send uh, their results uh, to some other worker in that cluster. They would combine those smaller results and give you the entire sum of the entire, entire object. And the way that DAS does this is it takes your Python code and then uh, creates this uh, graph. And this is a graph of all different uh, just uh, small tasks that need to be called on individual parts of that uh, of that large task array. And this way, uh, it can just split those small tasks across your uh, compute cluster, and then we'll combine those results uh, for you to get that one result. And the way that you typically do this uh, is uh, that you have some kind of driver programming. Uh, this is a Spark example uh, that you talk to, uh, where, the, where the Spark context is in this case. Uh, that's where you, uh, uh, you create your code. And then this driver program then distributes that work for you across your nodes. And typically, uh, you don't enter 
your data through this driver, driver program, you typically tell your worker node where to fetch that data. So it could be a database, or it could be S3 bucket, and you tell those worker nodes, just fetch the data from there, and then the worker nodes just fetch that data directly themselves. Otherwise, you would immediately run into the bottleneck of your driver program. Um, so, in conclusion, the GIL app for sing single-threaded applications, it actually works really well. It's really fast, uh, nothing to complain about. For IO-bound applications, it's, it's also a great solution. Uh, I mean, all IO-bound operations uh, within the Python center library release the GIL uh, before the CPU starts idling. For web servers, it runs great. Web servers is usually is, is more I/O bound than it is CPU bound, uh, but things like uh, uWhiskey use a combination of processes and threads within those processes to gain maximum performance. Uh, so that's com that's completely solved. Uh, for machine learning, it's it's a little bit iffy. Uh, so for most data science uh, projects, there's there's great libraries that solve part of these problems for you, but it's generally a CPU bound problem. Uh, meaning that you occasionally run into issues where you have to do uh, m uh, multiprocessing, uh, which can sometimes result into, uh, um, yeah, uh, res constraints that you have to, to abide by. For CPU-bound single-node problems, you run into an issue. Uh, there you have to use multiprocessing, uh, which is, uh, works occasionally, but uh, also often is not, is not a great solution. Uh, and for CPU-bound multi-node, many cores um, among multiple nodes. Uh, Python is actually a great fit, surprisingly. You could almost call it a feature instead of a bug. It, it forces you to, thi to think another way. It forces you to think about many processes am among your cluster instead of forcing you to think, how, I, how do I use all my cor cores on my, uh, on my single node? So if you want uh, additional info about the uh, about the GIL, if you're feeling uh, particularly adventurous, you can have a look at the source code. It's on GitHub. Uh, if, you actually, if you just search for GIL uh, within that source code, you'll find where it's created and how it's used. Uh, the PI begin allow threads and PI end allow threads is the, is the critical section. So that those are the, the regions where the, the Python GIL is released and then reacquired. Um, there's also a great talk about understanding the GIL by David Beasley, who goes uh, much further into depth than I did. And then finally, there, there, there are some attempts at removing the gill from Python. Uh, so there's the gillectomy by Larry Hastings. Um, I believe he, he removed the gill from Python, but he saw uh, quite a performance decrease. I believe that's now, uh, he's now stopped trying. And there's, a, there's another attempt called no gill by Sam Gross, uh, which actually, he gets really close to the performance of the, uh, of Python with the gill. So uh, one of the big problems with removing the gill is that you don't want to decrease the single threaded performance. So you want the single threaded performance to stay the same and then increase the multi threaded performance. And Sam Gross actually gets really close to uh, having that single threaded performance be, uh, be leveled. Uh, so it might actually be possible that in a couple of years, Python no longer has a GIL, which would be great. I mean, if you get the, the single threaded performance to stay the same. Um, so. This, uh, this was it, thank you very much. So yeah, are there any uh, questions for the, is there, There's, there must be some questions guys, girls. So. So I'll just repeat the question since then it's in camera. So in your opinion, is it uh, uh, completely, uh, sorry, useless to uh, for CPU bound task to do multi-threading, right? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, it depends a little bit. So there are CPU bound tasks that are done in Python. It, make, it basically makes no sense. So as you saw, the, the for loop that did nothing, uh, multi-threading usually makes performance worse instead of better. Uh, however, there's also CPU bound task, for example, like using NumPy or using some other kind of library that does uh, that task in C or C++ underwater. Uh, you can actually gain a little bit of performance improvement. But unfortunately, NumPy is not very clear about which functions are threaded or which functions do release the gill and which, do, which don't. Uh, so you typically have to, uh, 
uh, you have to do you have to do trial and error and just uh, just time it to see uh, see what the performance improves. Anyone else? So the question is, would you like to have a Python without the Gil? Or, uh, well, that's actually <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, if we can have Python with all the same goodies that we have today, uh, then Python without the Gil would be great. I mean, it, it only constrains uh, a small percentage of the people that try to do multi-threading CPU-bound CPU tasks. Um, and just put constraints on those people. And, and they might eventually choose to use another language instead of Python that does not have the Gil. Uh, so if we can have the same type of I/O bound multi-threading performance as well as the same uh, single-threaded performance, I think it would be great. I mean, it's just a nuisance, the, the Gil. We could get rid of multi-processing, just use multi-threading. Uh, there, there's, uh, there's just upsides to removing the Gil. I have a follow-up question on that. Um, you said they were already trying to remove the gill in 1999, so mm -hmm. it's 22 years now. Do you ever see it actually happening? Um, yeah, so that that latest attempt I, uh, I told you about, Sam Gross, he, he g actually gets fairly close. Uh, so he has recently talked to the, the, the Python core developers. Uh, so I could see it happening. I don't expect it to happen for at least a couple of years. Uh, but eventually I could see it happening. One of the unfortunate things about removing the gill is that uh, you might have to change your API, uh, which uh, might break a lot of integrations with libraries, uh, which is really unfortunate. Um, so th there's also quite a few people that depend, de depend indirectly on the gill. So they use the, instead of building, uh, instead of using their, their own lock, which they should have, uh, they're just, uh, using the gill as as that lock, so a lot of libraries need to be rewritten as well. So there, there's definitely downsides, but eventually, yeah, I could be, I do see it happening. Okay. The no gill, yeah. Yeah. So, someone in the audience said uh, Guido von Rossum likes uh, the no gill uh, solution. <laughs> So are there any more questions? Uh <laughs> why, why not just use another language instead of Python? You're at the, young, the, the wrong conference there, uh, <laughs> buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so, so typically what we do is we do the, the computationally heavy stuff we already do in, in another language. I mean, uh, Python is written in C, so a lot of the functions that you call in Python are actually implemented in C. And the same for NumPy, it's, it's all written in C. So there's one more question over there. So the question is, if you remove the gill, is it, um, uh, does it, uh, uh, if you just use Python when you start out, uh, does it uh, have an impact on you or is it only impacting you if you use multi-threading itself? Um, so I think it would make Python a little bit simpler yet even uh, to have the gill removed. I mean, right now you have this uh, weird issue where you occasionally have to use threading and occasionally have to use a, a, a multi-processing, uh, which is just a weird split that's not really necessary. So as long as you're not using the gill, single thread code would remain exactly the same. And I think that multi-threading would actually become a little bit easier for newcomers to Python. Yeah. Uh, Gil Yeah, 
So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try yeah. to repeat it. <laughs> and, and it you, you, would, you, you do have to rewrite parts of the standard library. So parts of the standard library do depend on the gil being there. Uh, so they don't use their own lock, instead uh, rely on the gil. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's a big, uh, it requires a big effort to remove the gil, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so just maybe one more question. If one last question. Anybody has some burning question? Well. Well then, I was just ask, wondering: the, the, is it is it something the the no gil uh, uh, thing uh, uh, solves, like uh, re rewriting things in the standard library, or is it? Uh I'm not sure. It's okay. just a proof of concept. They've taken Python 3.9 and then forked it off and and removed the gil there. Uh, so I'm not sure if it rewrites the entire standard library. I guess not. Yes, probably. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And then. Uh as you know, as a speaker, you get a small gift from the organization. Uh, here you are, and uh, give a big round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>